Chapter 40 Exiting the Great Hyrule Forest had not been nearly as difficult as entering it had been. The Deku Tree assigned Link a guide, in the form of one of the diminutive Koroks, and Link followed it as it bounded from tree to tree, occasionally popping out to play tricks on him. Still within the day, they passed through the Lost Woods without any trouble. When he finally emerged from the trees the day after drawing the Master Sword, leaving the waving Korok behind, he was surprised that it was still early in the afternoon. It seemed strange to him that it should still be so early, considering how large the forest was, but he ultimately chose not to dwell on it. The Lost Woods defied all logic and reason. But with the sun still high overhead, and the freedom to move along at his own pace without having to worry about taking care of his horse or anyone else, Link began walking. He walked for the rest of the day, feeling both energized and determined. Summer in Hyrule brought with it later sunsets, and he used this to his advantage. He was far enough away from the castle that he did not need to worry about roaming guardians, though he did keep an eye out for any sign of them. The path down the hill stretched on for miles, and it was bordered on either side by thick trees, which he hoped would provide cover for any guardians that might actually be lurking by. As he walked, he began to speak again, looking vaguely in the direction of the castle. He spoke about his experiences in the forest, getting lost, and the things he'd seen. He spoke of the memories that flashed through his mind when he touched the sword. He spoke of how the sword communicated with him. He still wasn't sure if Zelda could hear or see him now, but he felt that it was important that he do this. He hoped that she was listening. He hoped that it helped her somehow. She'd been so pleased when he spoke his mind with her. It's only going to be a little bit longer now, he said as the sky overhead darkened. I have a long walk to get back to Kakarika Village, and then I need to try to get to Hatano. Hopefully I can get a hold of Pura somehow. But without my Sheikah Slade, I'm going to need hers. I could probably just ride Spirit to the desert, but teleporting with hers will save at least a few days, I think. To say nothing of the Yika clan. This was what Zelda used to do, he realized with a wry smile. She often spoke of her plans out loud, even before she and Link began speaking to each other. He had a distinct image in his head of her walking purposely through a field. The Sheikah Slate held out in front of her, and she talked about plans to travel to Death Mountain. Was that perhaps why he'd taken up doing the same? I... I miss traveling with you. There's still so much that I don't remember, but... I've felt it since I woke up. It hasn't felt right traveling through the country alone. He felt embarrassed saying such things out loud. He still didn't know what friendship they eventually developed, but... Well, the diary, at least, indicated that they were close. Other flashes of memory did as well, though... They were still difficult to parse through. Even traveling with others isn't right, he said, voice lowering. He took a deep breath and straightened, steeling himself. So I'm going to have to get this done quickly. Only Nabora stands in my way, and then we'll finish Ganon together. A soft breeze blew through the trees, and the first stars appeared. As he looked up at them, a streak of light crossed the sky. A shooting star... He smiled faintly before pressing on, increasing his pace. Though night fell, he still felt energized enough to keep walking for a time. He spotted the stable in the distance well into the night, illuminated by the moon overhead. In the couple of hours following dusk, he had made his way down the path and out of the forest. The path forked, but he continued traveling south, and the horsehead stable eventually came into view. Link frowned as he observed the sable from a distance. He couldn't see any lights within, nor did he see any indication of movement. 
It was late, so the lack of movement didn't surprise him. But the absence of light did concern him. He would have expected the stable hands to keep at least a lantern or two burning to ward off would-be horse thieves. After glancing around for any telltale signs of monsters or guardians, he approached cautiously. What he found confirmed his suspicions. The stable had been occupied, but it was now deserted. It appeared to have been deserted recently, too, as looters had not yet had a chance to ransack the place. Link rummaged around for a time, and finally pulled out an oil lantern that he was able to light. Whoever had been at the stable had left in a hurry, it seemed. Various possessions were still strewn about the common room. Mugs sat on the tables, and there was at least one plate of unfinished food. What happened here? Link placed the lantern down and stepped outside again, peering around the darkness. He wished he had the Sheikah Slate. Its telescoping abilities were incredibly useful. He felt almost blind without it. He did not, however, see any cause for concern, however. If it had been a guardian, surely this building would be destroyed, right? He thought, as he approached one of the tables and sat down, looking around the dim room. Perhaps the residents of the stable had heard the guardians rampaging over the hills nearby, and had run before they arrived. He hoped for that to be the case, though he worried about his proximity to the castle. Without his Sheikah Slate, he wasn't sure of its exact location, but he thought that he had a rough idea. An idea struck him, and he began to dig through what he could find around the stable's interior. He ultimately came up short, however. He found no maps left by merchants or travelers. Of course, those were probably taken with them as they fled. He did, however, find quite a few other supplies. Cooking utensils in the kitchen, a travel pack with a full bedroll and other provisions, even a cloak. It was likely thicker than he would have preferred in the summer heat, but it might come in handy. Feeling at least bolstered at the prospect of sleeping in a warm bed for the night, Link went into the small kitchen, lighting lanterns as he did so. He rummaged through it until he found their supply of salted meat. The meat had been sitting for some time, but it looked as though it wouldn't make him sick. He started a fire in the stove and began cooking up a meal for himself. I'm not used to cooking in a full kitchen, he thought with a wry smile. I'm more comfortable with a cook pot over a fire pit. Still, however, it was also nice to have a fairly well-stocked kitchen. He hummed softly to himself while he cooked. In a short manner of time, he carried his plate of steaming food out into the common room. He was no longer alone. Another man, close in height and build to him, bent down near Link's gear in the dark room, which he had rested up against the table he sat at earlier. To his dismay, that gear included the Master's Sword. When Link came out of the kitchen, the man stood up quickly, turning to face him, a wary look on his face. He had a narrow pointed face and blonde hair that nearly reached down to his shoulders. He was armed, Link saw, with a familiar weapon one of the curved Sheikah Kodachi blades. In fact, he appeared to be dressed in very Sheikah-like robes. That did not help Link's feelings of wariness. Not after the Yiga attacks. They watched each other warily for a time before finally the man smiled. Got any of that left over for me? I'm starving. Link inclined his head back towards the kitchen. There's still some left in there. Help yourself. The man didn't move. Neither did Link. After a few more moments, the man gave a nervous laugh. Are you, um, a traveler? Not going west, are you? No. South. You? East. Visiting the Gorons, Link asked. He carefully set the plate of food down on another table beside him, but he kept a hold of his lamp. What? No. The man shook his head quickly. His long blonde hair which hung down partially over his face, whipped around as he did so. Akala. Link raised an eyebrow, curious. Kasudo? Yes, you've been there. A thought struck Link, and he tilted his head slightly, inspecting the man. He did look somewhat familiar, now that he looked more closely. You wouldn't happen to know Robbie and Jaren, would you? The man rested his hand on the pommel of his sword and Link tensed. Why do you ask? I'm an old friend of theirs. That's funny. 
I don't remember ever seeing you before. Are you Grante? The man stopped, the worried expression on his face becoming confusion. How did you... Link exhaled, body relaxing. I'm Link. I'm not actually sure if your father ever said anything about me. Grante looked at him, thinking that his eyes widened. He glanced back down toward Link's gear, the master's sword, and then back up at him. You're serious? I am. Damn. And I thought you were a looter. An easygoing smile appeared on his lips, and Grante relaxed. So, it finally happened then. Just like Dad always said it would. You woke up. Link couldn't help but return the smile. Much had happened since he woke up nearly three months prior. It's been a while, but yes. He walked over and placed his plate of food down at the table. He still felt better to be within arm's reach of the Master Sword. He trusted Dorian, after all. Are you the reason the Calamity's been going so crazy, and the Guardians have been swarming all over the place lately? Bronte asked. Link winced but nodded. That's a relief. I was on my way back home because I saw how the Guardians were acting. Thought I needed to warn my parents that the Calamity was about to break free. The word sent a chill of dread through Link's heart. He had to move quickly. He wasted too much time as it was, retrieving the Master Sword. It's getting close, Link said, grimacing. I don't know how much time we have left. Grante's smile faded. Are you... going to be able to do it? Beat it, I mean. Link reached down past Grante and picked up the Master Sword. He unsheathed it, and the Sheikah man took a step back to give him room. With this, I plan to. He wasn't sure if he truly had all of the confidence that he tried to show with his voice, but it had the desired effect. Bronte looked at the Master Sword with widening eyes. Is that really it? The legendary blade? Dad told me about it, even showed me some sketches, but... It is. Bronte reached a hand out but stopped, glancing at Link for permission. He nodded and Grante touched the blade with his hand, running his fingers along its surface. No obvious marks or signs of being forged. He hesitated only a moment before looking back at Link. May I? Link hesitated, glancing down at the Master's sword. But then, feeling somewhat foolish, he held the hilt out to him. Grante took it carefully, and he held the sword out, feeling its heft. He turned it this way and that, inspecting the blade closely. At one point, he held it straight out, looking down its length. Finally, he handed it back to Link. What were you looking for? Link asked, taking the Master Sword back and sheathing it. Bronte shook his head. I don't really know. Imperfections. Dad told me that the sword was made by the goddess herself, but I... Well, I don't know, he laughed. But it was a hollow sort of sound. He looked pale. Link set the Master Sword down against the chair. You know a lot about forging. Just a hobby of mine. You know, Dad has his guardians. Mom has her shrines. I don't know, ancient Sheikah tech never really did it for me. But that furnace was pretty great for making normal stuff. That's why I've been traveling around. I figured that it would be good for me to get some time on the road, visit some of the other races, and learn some of their techniques for making armor and weapons. What races have you spent time with? Not as many as I'd like. I spent some time up in Goron City. The Gorons were welcoming enough, though it was nearly as hot as the forge up there as, as it was. But they're pretty basic with their forging. They just like to hammer sheets of metal together until it looks halfway decent. Bronte leaned forward, an expression more excited now. Azora didn't really like having me around when I visited them. I didn't get the sense that they liked Shika for some reason, but I did get a chance to observe their blacksmiths for a while. They do some really interesting stuff to keep their silver from being too soft. Link smiled even more. Now that Grante was talking, he could see some more of his parents' scholarly excitement in him. 
So, then I tried going south to visit the Gerudo. But, well, you know them. Couldn't get a damn thing out of them, or in to see their smithies. I did buy a couple of weapons from them, though, so I hope that I could get some idea of what they do. I think they're pretty standard fare, though. Did you make it to the Rito yet? Link asked. I was on my way there. They do some really interesting stuff to keep their weapons light, but then I saw the calamity of it and over the castle a lot. So I decided to investigate. That's when I saw the Guardians, and knew I needed to get back to my parents, and let them know what is happening. Link frowned. Why here then? Isn't this a little out of your way if you're going towards Akala? I used the ridge north of the castle to travel. That's where the Guardians were mostly concentrated from what I could see. This is right on my way from there. I hadn't expected it to be deserted, though. At least mostly deserted. He nodded in acknowledgement toward Link. I know the area, Link said, thinking back to his heron escape from the Guardians along that very ridge. How did you avoid the Guardians? They were, uh, looking for me, actually. Bronte smirked. You don't grow up with my father without picking up a few tricks. Guardians are pretty quick, but they're dumb. They don't have very good memories. Even if they see you, if you hide well, they'll eventually forget all about you and move on. Well, they weren't so hard to avoid, either. Link thought back to his desperate chases and near disasters that he'd experienced in the week following his defeat at the castle. It disturbed him more than a little to know that this man, whom he decided had to be younger than he was, apparently found the Guardians so easy to outwit. Perhaps he needed to talk to Robbie more about dealing with the mechanical beasts. After a few moments of silence, Grante glanced toward Link's plate of food, which no longer steamed. Are you being serious? About there being more food? What? Oh, yeah, I made too much for just myself anyway. It's in the kitchen. Grante rose quickly and disappeared into the kitchen to fetch a plate for himself. Link watched him go and then quickly stood, hurrying to the other man's pack and opening the top flap. He fingered through the contents for a short time before placing the flap back and walking back to the table, sitting back down just as Grante emerged from the kitchen. He'd found no evidence of a Yiga mask or equipment. The truth of the matter was that Link expected to encounter Yiga on his way back to Kakarika Village. He hoped not, but the road back to the village was long, and he knew of at least two in the area, assuming they hadn't been involved on the attack in Kakariko. He doubted that the Yiga knew of his disappearance, but if they did, it would only likely make him more determined to find him. It was a disconcerting thought. At least, he was reasonably certain that Grante wasn't one of them. So, they're hunting you, Grante asked as he sat down across from Link. Link sighed, taking a bite of his food. Maybe he should have left that tidbit out. I paid the castle a visit. So have I, but never attracted the notice of a dozen guardians, Grante said. Link tapped a finger against his leg in annoyance. Neither have I. I attracted the notice of Ganon. The other man frowned, leaning forward. It's under control over them again? That was always under the impression that it had lost control over them, and they reverted to a state of autonomy, albeit a corrupted one. He's the son of Robbie and Jaren, all right? Link thought wryly, as he worked out exactly what Grante said. It... I don't know, but it sent them after me. Grante looked down at his plate of food quietly, and then lifted his head, looking around the room. I've been here before. Usually it's pretty quiet, not a lot of travelers up this way. Mostly just adventurers and treasure seekers. Not a lot to the north for most people, other than the Thyfler ruins. They were always in a vulnerable spot, though. I guess with the activity at the castle, they finally decided to move on. Silence fell between them as they ate their meal. The dim common room was eerily quiet, save for the sound of their utensils on the wooden plates. Finally, Grante spoke again. Ganon's about to rise again, isn't it? Link nodded. Grante grimaced and glanced down at the Master Sword. He looked scared, and Link thought he could understand. The Sheikah's life hadn't been so different than that of the lives of people... 100 years ago. He grew up hearing stories of how terrible the calamity would be, how preparations needed to be made in advance of his return, and that a hero may rise to save them from it. 
I'll be ready for when it does. He finally said, meeting Grante's eyes. I'm on my way to free the final divine beast of its control. Now that I have the Master Sword, that divine beast is the last thing standing in my way. He saw the change in Grante immediately. The man sat up straighter and some color returned to his cheeks. He smiled at Link and nodded. The air of foreboding retreated. The rest of their small meal passed comfortably. They spoke of each other's adventures in Hyrule and even some of their hopes in, for the future. Link kept many of the hardships he faced along the way to himself, trying to project an air of confidence. Just because he felt more competent now, didn't mean that everyone needed to know how he'd blundered through the first three divine beasts. The next morning, Link and Grante walked together for the first part of the day, until they came to a fork in the road. They parted ways there, with Grante continuing on to the east towards Akala, and Link heading south across a bridge that he'd recognized from his journey to Zora's domain. That evening after making camp, he climbed to the top of a hill that overlooked Hyrule Field. From there, he could see Hyrule Castle in the distance, a dark shadow surrounded by red mist. A cloud of malice that surrounded it seemed stronger than it had been before. As he observed the castle that night, speaking softly to Zelda and hoping she could hear, he watched Calamity Ganon's hazy form rise again, before being pulled back down. The ground underneath him shook. He retreated back down the hill and slept uneasily that night, his dreams plagued by scenes of fire and anguish. When he began moving again the following day, it was with a heavier step. The next day's journey began to worry Link. True, he did not encounter any Yiga on the path. Perhaps they assumed him to be unlikely to come from this direction. But he did start finding camps of moblins and bokoblins. They tended to be small, and he dispatched the monsters without great difficulty. But this stretch of road had been clear before, as it was the only road that led north towards Zora's domain and Death Mountain. And hadn't both the Zora and Gorons agreed to send some of their people south to Hatano Village? After the third ambush by a group of monsters, Link felt certain that something was wrong. He picked up his pace, leaving some of his supplies behind to lighten his load. He found what he feared by the end of the day. The inn and stable that had stood sentinel at the bridge leading to Hyrule Field was no more. The wetland stable, once surprisingly militant with spiked walls and watchtowers, was a burned-out husk as were the surrounding buildings and much of the forest. No, oh, he whispered, as he carefully stepped over the fallen remains of one of the watchtowers. It hadn't burned, at least not initially. Rather, it looked as though something had hacked at its supports with an axe, causing it to fall over and into the stable's main structure. Ash covered much of the ground, and Link could see footprints in it. Bare feet that belonged to moblins and bokoblins. Perhaps some of the very ones he'd slain that day. He carefully picked through the wreckage until he found what he was looking for, but didn't want to find. Bodies. Several charred Hylian corpses were burned in the wreckage of the stable, and he found several more elsewhere, some still wearing the leather sported by the men that watched over this small community. At least one of the bodies was a child. The wetland stable had finally fallen, and Link feared that he was somehow responsible for it. There wasn't much Link could do for the poor people killed by the monsters. He hadn't had the strength or the time to dig through all the wreckage and pull out the bodies. He hated leaving them in their state, feeling that to do so was callous and disrespectful. But he had no choice. Cass once told Link, that the people around the stable had been given hope by his success in Zora's domain and Death Mountain. That hope meant nothing in the face of the disaster that eventually befell them. He only prayed that he wouldn't be too slow to save the others. He didn't stop to rest that night, even as the land sloped up towards the giant rock pillars that surrounded Kakarika Village, and his legs started to burn. He kept moving. Night fell, and he continued pushing through the exhaustion. He entered the narrow paths west of Kakariko Village shortly after midnight. An hour later, 
The dark village came into view. Halt! A voice in the dark called out. He recognized the voice, though it surprised him. He honestly hadn't even thought to expect hearing that voice again. Dorian? Link asked. His own voice hoarse. He'd run out of water several hours prior, and hadn't searched out any more. He looked around, but couldn't see any sign of the man. There was a silence for several seconds before a shadow nearby moved, and Dorian stepped into the light of the moon overhead. He was dressed in dark garb, similar to the kind of clothing that Paya had worn that night, and his white hair was covered by a dark hood that made Link think of the Yiga outfits. Dorian looked at him warily, but then finally he approached. When he got close enough to make out Link's face, he gasped. Master Link, you were... We all thought that you... He suddenly reached out and clasped a hand on Link's shoulder. You're alive. Highly be praised. You're alive. Dorian, the night I left... The women, are they... Safe. They're safe thanks to you. And there have been no Yiga attacks since that night. Link stiffened at the name. You were once a Yiga, weren't you? Dorian hesitated, but then he finally nodded. Yes. And I fear that I am the man responsible for passing on information about you to them. I am the reason you were hunted. A surge of anger rose up within Link. This man was the one responsible for the Yiga. This was the man responsible for the worry and fear that Link endured since Delia's attack. Even her death could be laid at Dorian's feet. But then he remembered that night. He remembered the words spoken by the Yiga to Dorian, the threats. And he remembered which side Dorian had ultimately fought on. His anger melted away just as quickly. And your children, are they safe? Dorian searched Link's eyes uncertainly. Finally, he said, yes. Good. Link reached up and patted Dorian's hand. I know that you did what you had to do to keep them safe. The other man relaxed, and a smile appeared on his face. Thank you, Master Link. I... I will not fail you again. I swear it. Link kept his face smooth, though inwardly he grimaced. When had people started worrying about failing him? Now, Dorian said, removing his hand and standing up straighter. We must tell Lady Impa and Paya. They have been beside themselves with worry over you, after you disappeared. So much has been happening these last few weeks. There is much to update you on. He stood in the dimly lit antechamber of Impa's home, as Dorian hurried up the stairs to wake Impa and Paya. The Sheikah lit one of the small lanterns in the room, providing enough light to see by. The room seemed much as it always had been, though his eyes were drawn to the center of the floor. There wasn't even a sign of the dead Yega. The wood had been scrubbed clean of the blood. How long had Paya worked at the wood to remove the stains? He had no doubt that it would have been her. Killing a man. It did something to someone's mind. It was something that he wished she never had to go through. There was a sound at the top of the stairs, a shuffling, followed by rapid footsteps. He looked up to see Paya's form. Dressed in nothing but her sleeping gown, much as she had been the night of the Yiga attack, rushing down the stairs. She paused at the landing and looked across the room towards Link. She placed a hand to her lips, eyes wide, and then she hurried down the rest of the stairs. She ran across the room, and to his surprise, threw her arms around his neck. She was weeping. He stood in shock for several moments before hesitantly wrapping his arms around her. I'm sorry, he whispered, as he held her close. She didn't respond, but continued to cry, trembling in his arms. He hadn't expected this. He knew that they would worry, and acknowledged that they might have even thought him dead. But this reaction was much more personal than he'd been prepared for. Why did you go? Paya finally asked, her voice muffled, 
Her face was still pressed to his shoulder. He heard another sound now. He glanced up to see Impa making her way down the stairs, Dorian at her side to help her. Her eyes were fixed on Link, hard and accusing. I had something I had to do, Link said. I'm sorry for worrying you, but I wasn't in my right mind at the time. She finally pulled away, looking at him with red, tearful eyes. He gripped both of her arms, squeezing them gently and smiling. I'm all right now. Her lips quivered and parted, then shut again. Her cheeks flushed a deep crimson, and she turned her back to him. Before he could say anything, however, Impa spoke. And what was so important that you had to do, Link? Her voice cracked like a whip. She reached the ground and began making her way across the room towards him. You went to the castle, didn't you? Link was surprised they even guessed that. Yes, I went to try to save Zelda. We suspected as much after your Sheikah slate turned up in the river. What? But why did you take so long to return? We've been searching everywhere for any sign that you survived your foolish gamble. The Guardians rampaged around the castle, destroying anything that still remained after the last hundred years. We about gave you up for dead. Link hesitated and then reached back, grasping the Master Sword, and pulled it free of its scabbard. Impa's eyes widened, and she took in its spotless blade. She raised a hand to her lips, and he thought he saw evidence of tears in her eyes as well. You impulsive, idiotic, magnificent boy! How did you find it? Was it in the castle? Zelda told me. Link took a step forward and bent to look at the old woman in the eye. I saw her, Impa. She was there. She... He laughed softly, unprepared for the rush of emotions that the memory brought. She protected me. She, well... She was pretty angry at me for going there, too, actually. It was a mistake, of course, but I just... I had to try. Impa looked at him quietly for a moment, and then she slapped him across the cheek. He grimaced, reached up and rubbing his cheek. But he didn't protest. He likely deserved it. When he met her eyes again, however, she smiled warmly. You know, she said. I worry then, as your memories returned, you might try a stunt like that. You always tended to jump into fights that you had no business surviving. I had hoped to be able to dissuade you of such brashness. But you didn't give me a chance. It doesn't matter, though, though. You're alive. Ganon's close, Impa, he said, lowering his voice. It knows I'm alive now. I didn't know before. Zelda has been blinding it all this time. She's so powerful. If you could have seen her, you... Impa placed a hand to his lips, and Link noticed that she, strangely, glanced toward her granddaughter. Aya, dear, don't stand there in your nightgown. Go get dressed and then put some tea on for us. There is much that we must discuss and not much time, I fear. Link glanced towards Paya, but wasn't able to catch a glimpse of her face as she quickly nodded and hurried up the stairs. His heart sank, as understanding finally dawned upon him. All this time, he'd merely thought her shy and anxious around other people. How long had she felt so strongly for him? I'm sorry, he said, looking back at Impa. I didn't... Shh. She'll be all right. She's just overwhelmed at the moment. She mourned you, Link. We all did. But you are back now, and that's all that matters. A determined smile crossed her lips. But please, tell me about the princess. She's still fighting it, imprisoning Ganon. He could remember her shining form, so radiant and bright, as if in defiance of the gloom of the castle. She spoke to me. She appeared right in front of me and spoke to me. She was real, too, not a spirit. She told me that she had Ganon under control, but that I needed to get the Master Sword and free the final Divine Beast as quickly as possible. The words spilled out of him in a rush. When he finished, Impa smiled and reached up, wiping a tear from her eye. It is good to hear that she remained strong. Perhaps that was the true purpose of making her wait so long to awaken her powers. It may very well be the reason she's had the fortitude to continue fighting. 
even after all these years. It was a disturbing thought. Had his fall been preordained then? Surely not, though it did make a brutal sort of sense. Paya finally came back down the stairs, wearing a robe over her nightgown. Her eyes were still red and puffy, but she had mostly composed herself now. Link met her eyes, and she paused and then blushed, hurrying past him into the kitchen. His heart ached, yet what could he do? He cared for Paya, of course, but not in that way. Perhaps if things had been different, he very well could have loved her, but now... His heart belonged to another. No, he told himself. There's still too much you don't know. Too much you don't remember. Don't start thinking things like that before you remember everything. Your feelings have misled you before. They remained in silence for a time, until Impa turned and approached the dais which she normally sat. Link watched her curiously as she reached around the pillow and pulled out a rectangular object. He stood up quickly, eyes widening. Is that the Chica Slate? Impa faced him again, holding it out to him. He took it with reverent hands, tracing his fingers over its textured surface. He turned it over and found the same familiar colored icons as always. He gently pressed his finger to the gallery icon, and the dozens of photographs from his previous journey with Zelda appeared in a series of rows on the screen. His heart swelled, and he began to flip through some of them. A lump formed in his throat, as he found himself retracing some of his own memories through photographs. The Great Plateau, Eber Mountains, Goron City, Zora's Domain, Hyrule Castle. So many of the photographs had a deeper meaning to him now. How? His voice was a croak, heavy with emotion. He tried to swallow the lump in his throat. How did you find it? I thought it was lost. Your Zora Prince found it. Sidon? Yes, he was apparently out patrolling near the castle and found it at the bottom of the moat. That's how we knew you must have gone to the castle. That's why we feared you dead. Link flipped through the photograph of Zelda in the Spring of Power. There were so few pictures of her, and he found that he wished he had more. He continued to search through the pictures until he found another one that meant far more to him now. The photograph of all of them together, shortly after the champion ceremony. It wasn't the greatest photograph, due largely in part to what appeared to be a joke by Daruk, who had decided to squeeze all of them together at the last moment. However, he gazed at the picture of the gathered champions. The picture of his friends. Mifa, Daruk, Rivali, Urbosa, Zelda. His face flushed and his fingers began to squeeze the Sheikah Slate. I'm going to do it, Impa, he said, his voice low and trembling. I'm going to go to the desert, free your bosa, and then I'm going to ram this sword down Ganon's throat for what it's done. And you won't be alone. He looked up at Impa, who had a look of fierce determination on her face. She smiled tightly as she spoke. In your absence, Robbie, Para, and I have been working on some plans. I'll let them tell you about it in detail. We have a meeting planned at Robbie's laboratory in the morning. They will want to see you again as well. He nodded. He needed to visit Robbie again anyway, to get ancient arrows. He had intended on traveling to Hatano village to borrow Pura's Sheikah Slate, but this would be even better. It would save him a great deal of time. Paya emerged from the kitchen carrying a tray with a steaming kettle of tea and three small cups. She approached Link and knelt, placing the tray on the ground. Link eased himself down next to her. He watched her as she quietly lifted the kettle and poured amber tea into each of the cups. She appeared to be avoiding his eyes. That wouldn't do. Paya. She froze at his voice. He remained quiet until she finally turned her head to look at him. He gave her a smile. I never had the chance to tell you that I was impressed with how you handled yourself on the night of the Yiga attack. Not only did you keep calm despite everything that happened, but you held your own against a trained assassin. I fought a few of them now, and they're tough. The first one I encountered nearly killed me. Aya's face turned a deep shade of red, and he wondered if perhaps that had been the wrong approach. Uh, oh, that wasn't... Uh, I mean, 
I, I don't know. I was... I'm glad you came with me. I couldn't have handled all of that alone. Her mouth snapped shut and she looked down at the tea. But he thought that he saw a faint hit of a smile. Finally, she spoke. I was terrified. So was I, Link said, placing a hand on her shoulder. But even when afraid, you acted. That's what's important. Her smile grew stronger, and she looked back at him, whispering. Thank you. Link glanced at Impa, who winked. He removed his hand and reached down to lift one of the steaming mugs of tea. He sipped at it and sighed happily. This is good. I've barely had anything hot for the last few weeks. I spent the first two mostly hiding from guardians. Yes, it did seem as though they were acting oddly from the reports we got from your Rito allies, Impa said, lifting her own tea. They were searching for me? He asked, eyebrows raising. Of course they were. So were the Zora. The search only stopped a few days ago. We assumed that you must have either died or moved on from the castle. A fair assumption. Link saw Impa's eyes flick to the hilt of the Master Sword. It was in the forest, being watched by the Deku tree. Ah, Impa said, nodding. It was as I suspected then. What? She gave Link an apologetic smile. I did not know it was there, but it was one of the several possible locations that I considered. I did not tell you this because I did not want to send you on an escaped cuckoo chase when your focus should have been the Divine Beasts. Besides, the princess was very adamant that you would discover its location in time. Funny, considering she told it to me when I asked. He tried not to let some of the irritation he felt show up in his voice. If Impa had told him her suspicions earlier, perhaps she felt that you were just taking too long. Link fell silent, staring down at his teeth for a time. Finally, he looked back up and met Impa's eyes. What was my mother's name? The old Sheikah's eyes widened slightly, but she didn't initially respond, so he continued. My father was Arn. I remember that now. And my sister, who I didn't even know existed until recently, was named Arl. Emphasized softly. Link, you know why we didn't tell you everything up front. I... we all felt that it would be best to let your memories return gradually, rather than bogging you down with information up front. Just tell me your name, please. She's the only family member that I... I still don't have anything about. Medelia. Medelia. A soft name. A gentle name. Link smiled faintly still looking down at his tea. A face appeared in his mind. Blue eyes, long red blonde hair. A warm smile. Just a face, nothing else yet. It was enough for now. Thank you. Sorry for leaving you so long, boy, Link said, rubbing Spirit's nose. Spirit snorted, in apparent derision pulling his face away. Link sighed and reached into his pouch, pulling out a sugar cube. Truce? Spirit eyed him suspiciously with a great brown eye, and then leaned down, taking the cube from Link's hand. And then he pressed his face to Link's shoulder, nearly knocking him over. He laughed, scratching the horse behind his ear. All right, I get it, but you know, I'm going to have to leave again for a, a little while. Hopefully not as long, though. He walked around and placed the saddlebag on the horse. After tying it down securely, he took Spirit's reins in hand and led him out of the stable, out onto the village square, where Impa and Paya both stood waiting. He was wearing a new champion's tunic, one that Impa had made for him weeks ago when she saw that his old one was showing some wear after so many battles. He'd stowed the fourth tunic he'd received from the Karoks in his gear, though. It didn't feel right just abandoning it. Ready? he asked as he approached. Impa nodded, and he handed the reins to Paya. Removing the Sheikah slate from his belt, he navigated through its functions until he found the shrine just outside of Robbie's lighthouse. He pressed his fingers to it, and a blue circle of light appeared around them. He checked it to make sure they were all in the circle, 
before pressing it again. A few moments later, they appeared on the cliffs overlooking the Akala Sea. Salty sea wind whipped at their clothes, and the spirit snorted anxiously, looking around. Link hooked the Sheikah Slate back on his belt, and took the horse's reins, pulling his face down in order to soothe his nerves. It's amazing, Pia said, gasping, and stepping over to look out over the cliff. I've only seen the ocean once before. Link and Impa waited, letting her admire the view for a time. When she was satisfied, they walked the short walk to Robbie's lighthouse. The door to the lighthouse slammed open, and out stepped a woman that Link didn't recognize. She was shorter than Link by nearly a head, and had a shock of white hair that was styled in a fashion that was vaguely familiar. She wore round spectacles, and had a strange bow on her hair styled to look like an owl's face. Linky! she cried. You're alive! Pura? he asked, confused. The woman who he assumed to be Pura rushed forward and threw her arms around him in a tight embrace. She pulled away a moment later, grinning broadly up at him. Like it? I finally re-aged myself. Impa snorted derisively, and Pura shot her a smirk. Behind her, Robbie, Jaren, and Simon all hurried out, drawn presumably by Pura's announcement of his survival. I didn't know you were even capable of doing that, he said still thrown off guard by the woman standing before him. She was still young, no older in appearance than Link himself, and her expression still bore a childlike excitement. Now that he was over the initial shock, he could remember when she looked almost exactly like this from several of his memories. Pura shrugged. Yeah, well, I was almost done with the reaging rune when you first showed up, and after that I didn't have a lot of time to work on it, but with all the work we're doing now, I... Figured it was a good time as any to give it a shot. She snapped her fingers. You should have seen Simon's face when I did it. Turned as red as a tomato. Simon spluttered some behind her. Director Pura, you had no clothes on. Well, of course I didn't. It's not like those kid clothes were going to fit me any more now, wouldn't they? Snap, Simon, keep up. She glanced toward Paya, winking and stage whispered. Men. Completely useless around a pretty girl, right, Paya? I bet you knew all about it. Paya burst into giggles as Simon continued to stammer. Link found himself grinning as the others all approached him, greeting him, exclaiming over his survival. It took some time for things to finally settle enough for them to all file back into the lighthouse. As they did so, Link looked around and noticed that there was a considerably larger number of inert guardians around than there had been before. In fact, the entire hill seemed to be covered in them. Robbie, why are there so many more guardians around? He asked as he walked inside. That's all part of the plan, Robbie said, looking back at him and grinning. Come on, I'll show you. Robbie led him past his ancient oven, which appeared to be working on something, considering the whirring sounds coming from within it to several piles of equipment along the back wall. Link's eyes widened when he saw what appeared to be dozens of ancient weapons swords, spears, and arrows. He saw other things, too. Pieces of armor with Sheikah designs upon it, and what appeared to be a helmet. I've been having the ancient oven working around the clock on new equipment for weeks now, Robbie said, picking up the helmet and offering it to Link. That's why I have so many guardians out there. At first, Impus people were trying to disassemble the guardians on the black tree plains and just transporting me to pieces, but they were awful. I just Finally, just had them start transporting me, the Guardian's Hole. So you're building these out of harvested Guardian parts, Link asked, turning the helmet over in his hand. It was heavy and he couldn't actually see how one would see out of it. The entire face was covered. Exactly! We're preparing for the final assault on Ganon! Link frowned, looking at Robbie. He looked back down at the gear. Robbie, this is all quite a bit more than I could ever hope to use. I'm not even sure I needed another ancient sword now that I have the Master Sword. Not for you, for anyone else. What, do you think we're going to send you in there alone? The castle is swarming with guardians. Even with an army, I don't know if attacking head-on would be wise. I was able to sneak in without that much difficulty. Behind him, Impa snorted. Link ignored that and continued. 
I don't want to get a bunch of people slaughtered. This is my task. Then do you think the rest of us don't have a reason to fight? Jaren said, stepping up behind Robbie and placing a hand on his shoulder. Impa stepped forward as well, followed by Paya. We've stood aside for too long, Link. When you go in to attack Ganon, you will not be alone. But the Guardians, that's where I come in, Pura said, flicking his ear as she walked up beside him. He looked down at her in confusion. We've been working on a way to take the Guardians back. Robbie nodded. Exactly. Pura has been studying the Shika Towers. We believe that they are the key to greater control over the Guardians. With any luck, it will even be enough to take them back from Ganon's grasp. At the very least, we believe that we can disrupt his control over them enough to reduce their effectiveness. Link looked between each of them, seeing the same determination mirrored on each of their faces. Even Paya looked at him with a hint of defiance, as if daring him to forbid her from helping. I... You're sure? You think we can really take them back? He finally asked. We figure it can't get any worse, Pura said. But my research so far has been promising. Hopefully we'll have a proper answer for you by the time you get back from the last divine beast. But an army... We've already started working on that as well, Impa said. With your Sheikah slate, I have been reaching out to the various races. The Zora and Gorons have both already pledged their support to defeat Calamity Ganon, provided we can provide a proper countermeasure for the Guardians. The Rito are being as stubborn as always, but I believe they will agree as well. And of course, you will have Sheikah and Heiligans. We need you to get all friendly with the Gerudo when you visit them, Pura said, giving him a wink. Adding a bunch of giant warrior women would be a big help. Link was speechless. He hadn't expected any support of this kind. Sidon had promised him aid when he faced Ganon, but he hadn't thought much of it until now. But the idea of so many people in danger while he fought Ganon was disconcerting. This isn't something that we're giving you a choice in, Impa said, her voice firm. When you go to face the Calamity, you will do so at the head of an army. Slowly, he nodded. It made sense. If he lost, then the Calamity would just break free and begin its destruction anew anyway. At least this way, even if he fell, perhaps he could weaken it enough to be defeated through other means. Good, Pura said. Now, come on, let's figure out what else we need to talk about. I need to get back to my research. <laughs>